Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. We are, I've been invited to the Bourne Public Library, and I wrote a book called The Sea Captains of Cape Cod. And I'll tell you a little bit about my background. My name is Dr. Michael Prego. I'm an educator. I've been teaching for five decades or more, uh, for a while. Um, I was lucky enough to have been a foreign language teacher, originally French and Spanish at high school. Then I became an assistant principal, principal school superintendent, and then I became a college professor. So I've done a lot of various things. I've taught or been involved with programs, everything from preschool through doctoral programs. So I had kind of a, a good range of ex ex experiences in, in education. So I became interested. Let me tell you why I became interested in maritime history. I live in Brewster, Mass. And in Brewster, they have a golf course called the Captain's Golf Course. And every hole of the Captain's Golf Course is named after a captain. So you got Captain Foster, Captain Brooks, Captain so and so, you know, Captain Crosby, Captain Nickerson. So I went to the pro about five, six years ago. I said, I'd like to read about these people. Is there a book? He said, not that I know of. So that was my first adventure. So I wrote a book called Meet the Captains of the Captain's Golf Course. So that book is available. I, I, I didn't do it for money. I did it for the town and for the golf course. Uh, we did make copies for the members of the golf course, a few of them. Um, you know, again, it was not a money-making project, but I did have copies made and, and distributed them to the town. This is my first uh, adventure with a publisher. I'm working with Sunbury Press. So I'm going to be talking to you about various sea captains. One of the things that came to my attention as I began speaking about sea captains was the fact that every town, Chatham, Orleans, Bourne, they say, you know, we are the sea captains town. You know, like we have the most prodigious number, volume of sea captains. You know, everyone flows through Dennis or Yarmouth or Barnstable, wherever it might be. Um, and I found that to be partially true. There are probably a few towns that have more than others, but every town has a connection to the sea. And it's a very strong, very rich connection. So that's kind of my premise of the book, is I say that every town, and I picked all 15 towns, and I picked five captains at random. Today I'll just be talking about one captain per town. But you'll, you'll learn a little bit more as I, as I go along. So we're here in Bourne. So tonight I'll be talking about the Bourne, um, the population of Bourne. Bourne, just as I said before, every town has a strong connection. Bourne has a lot of things to be proud of relative to maritime history. So it's proud of me to, to do that for you. All right, so my presentation is divided into three elements. One, I'll talk about a little brief history of Bourne and the sea captains. I'll talk about general captains uh, generically, and then I'll talk about each one of the 15 towns briefly. I'll pick one. So excuse me if I keep turning around, but I want to advance the slide. So as you probably know, if you're from Bourne, Aptuxin is a great big um, tourist attraction, so to speak, um, with the original 1627, the Manamid River. When the, when the pilgrims began, when, the, when they first arrived here, they wanted to trade with the, with the indigenous people. So they said, well, let's, how could we get there? The easiest way would be by boat. So they did that, and then, you know, the, the indigenous people had harvests, they had food, they had blankets, they had different things. And what did the Americans, what did the English at that point have to offer? The English at that point in time had you know, products from England, they had China where they had different things which the natives never heard of, like guns probably, the unusual, it's furs, so things, different things of different varieties. So it was an equal trade to go back and forth. And I'm, I'm sure it's more a barter system than a pay system, but I wasn't there, so I don't know, don't know exactly. But it was a, uh, it's available there now, it's open to the public. If people want to go to a Aptuxa, so they have a replica of it. It's not the real one, but it's, it's I think it's a life-size representation of it. Another big thing that Bourne has is the Mass Maritime Academy. And that's, it's a big organization. There are three state Mass Maritimes. So Massachusetts, New York, and Maine all have state ones. And then there's a federal Mass Maritime in Kingsport, Long Island. So there's, there's, there's one there. And it's, it's a fantastic operation. I mean, I, it's a little bit that I know about it. Um, I was reading about a book of colleges and what people make for salary when they graduate from college. And I, I would, you, know, you would anticipate MIT, Harvard, Yale to be way up there. Guess what? Mass Maritime is right among the top. It's not the top, very close to the very top. So when you graduate from there, at, you know, at your young, tender age of whatever, 20-something, um, you can make a great salary. Sometimes uh, some people begin at 150 and, and higher. 
So it's a great, great place to go. It's a lot of engineering, a lot of science, uh, the different specialties within them, I'm sure there's. So it's a lot, a lot of interesting things. So the picture shows you the, the training ship. That's the USTS, the United States Training Ship. That's the Enterprise. So that's the, the boat, the Enterprise. That's where they train. And they take, take your month for six months at a time. And then I think twice every, maybe only once, but at least, there's at least one six month venture for everyone that's required. Everyone has to sh prove their worth at the sea. And you can see the campus is pretty, pretty elaborate. All right, so one thing I'll tell you is about Jonathan Bourne. Jonathan Bourne, um, his descendants gave the money for this library. Bourne is a very well-known name, you know, locally. Interestingly enough, there was a John Bourne who in 1650-ish, here was one of the first big settlers here, had a big, great big farm. So a lot of people think it might have been named after him, but it definitely was after this fellow right here because of the library donation and other civic buildings that the, his daughter, her daughter contributed. Um, one of the things which I found interesting about him was he realized that whaling was the next big thing. So he bought, every time he could buy a little something, he began at the age of 20, he bought a 1 16th share of a, of a boat. So back then, 1 16th share, you know, whatever it might be at the time, $20, $50, um, but you get a recompense. If the boat makes nothing, then you get nothing. But if the boat comes back and you make a lot of money, you get one sixteenth of the profit, whatever that profit might be. So he really said, this is really a good thing. So every time he got a chance, he had people who had gave him some kind of entrepreneurial spirit, gave him money too, so the, the capital financial system. Eventually he owned 17 different wells, completely owned them. Between the periods of 1881 to 1885, he made $2 million per year as an average. I mean, I could only imagine what $2 million would be able to buy you know, before the inflation in the 1880, you could buy it lots for $2 million. So he was obviously a very, very successful man. He became a, uh, an alderman of New Bedford, became a very known local politician. One of the things which I think was really interesting that I didn't, I didn't know until I did some research was that he is probably the main reason why our president was Abraham Lincoln. In 1860, he was invited to be a Democratic uh, convention. I see a typo there, it's okay, we'll forget the typo. Uh, um, and he was, he was kind of pushing. At that time, with William Seward from New York, many people preferred to have the Republican, they were kind of the beginning of the Republican Party. In fact, the Republicans kind of split in 1860. They, 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 they contribute Lincoln, they attribute Lincoln to be the, the founder of the, the new Republican Party, which could, could be debated in some respects. Um, but it is, it is partially true that they really split. The big difference with Lincoln, Lincoln said there should be no slavery anywhere. And William Sewey said, let's do this state by state. Let each state decide who should have slavery and who shouldn't. So that was a big topic. Because back then you had the Dred Scott decision and the, you know, a lot of the different things were pending, the three fifth votes for the slaves and all this kind of thing. So a lot of things were pending. Um, so he managed, he carried some weight. Johnson Moore carried some weight and they listened to him. And then eventually what Lincoln did become the nominee and won by a narrow margin. Um, so he was, it's an interesting, your local fellow right here was responsible for that. George Baldry is another fellow. He was, he was a fellow from France. He lived in France, and things were really bad in the early 1800s in France when Napoleon, after the first Napoleonic War was over and they still were still were, were fighting. His mother didn't think he could get a good job or find positions. So what he did was, the mother did, the mother just put him a snow away in the ship. She went on a boat, was coming to America, stuck him under a blanket and said, good luck. He was very young, he was like eight, nine years old at the time. Um, the captain found him, one of the captains who was bringing from products back from, from Europe back, back to Boston, and said, oh, isn't he cute, isn't he like? So they actually adopted him, they adopted him as, as a son. Um, I'm sure the mother didn't, I'm sure the mother was happy. We, I, don't, I could never find out if there was connection afterwards, but I, I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Um, so he was, he, he was famous for a number of reasons. One of the things was during the Civil War, people may or may not know about the Stone Fleet. One of the things that the, the South had, had you know, a few major harbors, Charleston Harbor would be a major harbor, and a few of them in Roanoke, Virginia. And so he, they said maybe if we block these harbors big enough, we can maybe stop the Civil War effort. They, they can't get their ships out, can't get them in, they might slow, slow their progress down. So they did it two ways. One is they 
any old ships that were around, they sunk them into the, into the he was, he was his, like a big group of men did this all together. He and like 16 other captains. And they, they, that was one part of it. And then they were called the Stoic Fleet, just lined them up across so people couldn't get around. But even though the idea was promising, it was a dismal failure. It just didn't work well at all. Like it just found an easy way to get around the port. So it just didn't work out too well. But uh, it, was, it was nice. It was nice that he was able to at least come up with the idea anyway. So it was a good premise. Another interesting story is William and Hannah Burgess. So there is a story that Hannah Burgess was taught by her husband to become a sea captain. So they took, they took long voyages together. And many of the wives did, by the way. I'd say a good, I can't give you an actual percentage, but I'd say maybe a fourth or a fifth of captains would very, sometimes take two and a half, three year trips and bring either their whole family or just their spouses with them on their trips. So she went, and she was definitely trained by William Burgess how to become a sea captain. So after about 11 trips, they did a lot of trips together, he died. Um, he was very, very sick. He was about two days away from getting to a doctor. He died on board. And she took held the helm and sailed the ship back to, to Boston. Now, this, that was the story at the time. After that happened, a lot of historians and researchers, they very carefully scrutinized the notes and how she worded, worded things and the terminology she used, and they said, Probably not. Probably. She may have assisted, she may have helped dipping the boat back, but she wasn't the main captain. She did not you know, have enough expertise to know all these things. So I, I, I'm just saying what I, what I read, so I'm not, saying, I'm not taking a position of this either way. But nonetheless, when she lived in Bourne, she was definitely given credit by the local town. The town viewed her as a very integral sea captain. You know, she was as worthy as any other sea captain. So even if you go to Sandra's Glass, a, a company, um, they have like a little light show about the, the Burgess family. And they mentioned that she was the captain of the ship, so you've got to take that with a grain of salt, I guess, when you, when you read that. Here's another interesting guy. Peter Storm came from Bourne. Peter, I love that name for a sea captain, Storm. It just seemed like a real sea captain's name to me. Um, he was a rum runner. That was a blockade runner. He knew definitely how to get around uh, things. He began to have a youth, very young. Many of his captains, by the way, all began at the age of eight out of 10. They were like, first they were cooks, then they were aides, scully galleries, you know, they were clean, but eventually they broke up to be first mate, second mate, and so on, and become, eventually become captain. He became captain at a very young age, got into both whaling, and then he began to specialize in South American products. So he went to Colombia, and Ecuador, and Venezuela, countries like that, and bring local harvest products, and sports of art, furniture, different things back to, to America. Now, in doing so, he met a fellow by the name of Simon Bolivar, who was the George Washington of the, of the South American continent, right? So he's the liberator of Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, about four different countries that he liberated. And he helped with that. Peter Storm, not only did he help him with the blockade and so on, but he actually physically fought with Simon Bolivar. So the Battle of Maracaibo was a little picture on the right-hand side. He was active in that battle, the Battle of Maracaibo. And that, 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 was, that was the battle that kind of determined Spain said, we're losing too much money, too much time. We're, you know, just have a nice, have a nice day, basically. And they left the South America, the, the, local, the local people, just like we too, took over our country, the Spanish South American people able to acquire their country. Uh, he was a he, very, very wealthy man. I read a story that at one point he wanted to put money into the Bourne Bank. <clears throat> the teller said, uh, well, how much do you want to contribute? So he, he gave her the whole thing and said, you know, I'm not sure I can take your money. And he said, why not? Your money that you gave me for one deposit is five times more than the entire bank is worth. So I'm not sure that I can take this. But let me check with it. Sure enough, a day later they called, oh, please come, come. Well, they, of course, would, they would take his money. Briggs, another fellow, Captain Briggs, he was uh, a local Civil War hero. He fought, he got, got a very big name. Um, he also became a local politician. He was a Barnstable County Commissioner. Um, they're saying that one of the reasons why, why Bourne split is because of him. You know, prior to 1888, Bourne was, Bourne was the last official town that's part of Cape Cod. And they said he was the one that kind of pushed for that. He said he had enough interest in politicians and wealth and people of you know, means to have this as a separated entity. So that's one of the reasons why he had Bourne the way it did. He was also a good friend of President Cleveland. So to the area of this area, this town called Great Gables, which is a lot of different residential homes, but there was his home, the original Cleveland home, had a big share of that peninsula, maybe half of it. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and he was the one. He, was, he would take the captain, um, President Cleveland, out. They would go fishing together. So he was, he was seen an awful lot in the, in the harbor. So that's one part of my, my tour. So that ends kind of my talk on, on, on Bourne in, in general. So now I'll be talking just generically about um, just general maritime history. Um, so this is a bark, as an example of a bark. But you can see the first two masts. When you have a difference between a two mast and a three mast ship, three mast ships are much bigger and usually much taller. So when you see the tall ships, they're usually talking about three mast ships. Two mast ships are a little shorter, a little wider, a little smaller, and they don't carry as much cargo. So this bark, as you can see, is two, the first two masts are a square rigged, and the last two is called fore and aft. So that's kind of made for speed, the way they, the way they have that boat. That's a bark. And there is bark and Argentine, the spooners, clippers, they're all variations of a theme, but they're, they're all basically just how the sails are configured. That's the basic difference between most of those, those names of those, of those ships. All right, so when I looked at the uh, maritime history, I found that there were definitely some periods which to me made sense. This is not from a book, so this is my own, my own division of maritime history here at Cape Cod. First division, I'd say, is pre European settlers, the indigenous people who were here. So that would be the first period. Second would be the war period, pre Revolutionary War, right through 1815. That was the War of 1812 ended, 1815. And then I would say the big age of sail, when you we were talking about just great big sail ships that made you know, fantastic voyages, I would say that it's 1820 to about 1850, roughly. And then, of course, they got a little bit bigger. By 1855, you got railroads and metal was invented, so the ships became much bigger. And they're powered by engines and powered by machines and could go much quicker. So that changed maritime history quite a bit. And then finally, they got very big. So by the Gilded Age, there was enough money in America. People wanted to go to Europe. So you know, we didn't have airplanes back then. So how do they want to go? On these fancy ships or commercial lines. So a lot of times, the, the commercial shippers would have ships and bring people to Europe as well as products. So they would share, share both. So the first group of people I said was the indigenous people. I think there's a misconception that the in indigenous people did not fish. They fished a great deal, from what I can tell, although there's, there's not many books written about it. There's a few, but not many. Um, the women basically, even then, even the women can, could go out in little dugout canoes and, and they could fish near the shore. They didn't go terribly far, but they went out and they, they, you know, they, they gathered quahogs and mussels and clams and whatever they, they could gather. And the men sometimes, well, at least, at least twice, sometimes they did deep sea fishing. Some of those dugouts too became much bigger. And that there's at least once a year that we go out, the, most of the Wapadawak tribes, each, each tribe is different to itself, and they all had different rituals and, and, and customs. But most of the tribes went out at least once a year. They call it the Padawe, which is like a whaling expedition. And when you think about how complicated it must be, I mean, they had, must have very primitive, crude instruments. I mean, even the harpoons were kind of just carved out of. You know, I don't know if they had metal, I doubt it. It was mostly wood and things of that nature. So these, these indigenous people took canoes, a little bit bigger than that, in groups, sometimes 15, 20 boats of God, and circled the whale somehow to find one first, and circle it, harpoon it, spear it somehow, and then drag it all the way back to the shore. So that was a lot of work to do that. Uh, with, for them, it was almost called a religious thing. They were chanting along the way, their songs they would sing. Um, so it was kind of a religious experience for them. One thing to which, amazing, which amazed me about, <laughs> okay. Um, so as you can see, you know, different areas of Cape Cod are different Wampanoag related tribes. They're all Wampanoags, but they were different. So the sachems, which was the head, the chief, many often would be a female. In fact, it was the female who determined they voted. And the males did not vote for their sachem, with only the females. And sometimes, almost half the time, the sachem could be a female. So we don't want to think about that. So even like in Point Judith in Long Island, there was a Queen Judith who was a big Wampanoag Indian native, very wealthy. She had a summer house there in Cape Cod, in Falmouth. And you know, so they, they had a lot of influence. When the Wampanoag boys wanted to get married, they had to get permission from their mom. And their mom would say, uh, who's the family? Who are they, who are they, where are they located? Where are they from? Just like we kind of do today, I guess, to some degree. And they looked over the, you know, the, their circumstances and all, and all of that, and they said yes or no. So it was a very female, very matriarchal uh, grouping of people. So this area of Cape Cod, the, the, the Manatees would be more in Dennis, the Shamis would be more Falmouth, uh, more in uh, um, Sandwich, the Patuxa would be away where we are. You can see the Potsket, and then you see Sakanesa would be the 
uh, the Falmouth would be, and so on. Mokpok and the North States would be over in Orleans and East Ham, and the Palmets would be up in the Toro and Wolfe. So they're all different groups, but they're all related. They're all connected. So I know they had a common language, or a variation of a language, but they were very close, so they could able to speak one to the other. They, they could do that pretty easily. So again, the first two ships, most of the early American ships before the Revo Revolutionary War were two mass ships. So they were smaller. So if you go left to right, you've got Snows, S-N-O-W, but they pronounce it Snoo, that's how they pronounce it. So Captain Joseph Snow would be writing a Snoo. And then you had Briggs, Brigantines, um, Clippers, Schooners, and so on. So yeah, they say each one, they're, they're all very close. The only configuration this would be how they, how they had the sails, what, how big the sails were and where they were located, but they were all, all kind of in the same area. And once we got to the war, things became a little bit different. We had privateers in America. Privateer was kind of a, an official way to become a pirate. Because don't forget, we did not have a navy. There was no America, so we couldn't have an army or, or a navy. So the government would allow people who had ships just to go out and in the name of America, we could seize the British ship, we could do this, we could seize, if, a, if an English ship came in the, in the harbor, they, we thought it was going to abet England or help English, we could seize that. So there are different, different ways they could, they could take advantage of that situation. Um, one of the things which surprised me too, was during this time period, before, this, before the Revolutionary War, privateers were given free reign. They were just like real mad pirates, you know, Blackbeard and Bluebeard, all these terrible things we read about. Probably a lot of that is accurate. But once the Revolutionary War began saying, well, if you're going to represent America, you can't be really bad. You're going to be a little bit. So they gave them some rules. You can't be cutthroat. You can't go on the ship and just you know, kill people. You, know, you have to do certain, you have to declare yourself and, and do every effort to be calm and that kind of thing. So they came out with, with a codified rule of what a privateer could do or not do. But if you look on the right-hand side, that boat is called a galleon. That's like a very typical pirate ship. And they was those were come from Europe. And they were a lot bigger. You can see the hull of the ship, how big it is, much bigger than our ship. So they could stay out on sea for a much longer period of time. They could confiscate goods, put them in the hole and the hold and so on, and keep, keep, keep on going. So that was very much a pirate ship. We had one gentleman who lived in Orleans on Tonset Road. His name was Crosby, Joshua Crosby. And he was the head cannoneer for Old Ironsides. Well, not only here during the Revolutionary War, but during the War of 1815, as well as the Great Lakes War. So if you can drive by his house, you'll see just a little tiny sign, a very small Cape Cod house, you know, inauspicious completely, but it says Captain, no, it's a captain, it said Cannoneer Crosby. So he was, he was an American hero for us. They didn't have newspapers back in those days. They had posters. So this kind of poster would be what people would, they'd put them in, I think, libraries, they'd put them in bookstores or markets, and, you know, town halls, wherever people gathered in, in group, they would let you know. This particular one, Witch of the Wave, was a poster they would use going to the gold rush. So there was a ship that would go from Boston all the way around the Cape, all the way to South America, then go to, way over to, to California. It took anywhere between 80 to 120 days. And it would cost you, at the time, depends on what year it was, but it could be as low as $35 one-way ticket. No food, I don't know how they manage that. I'm not sure how the food situation worked, but you, you could get there. If you can get there, then you could make some money. Um, the ship on top of the Red Jacket, which is kind of one, of one of the most known Cape Cod ships. And even that, one of the things I noticed too, that and many of the names of the ships that sea captains picked were indigenous captains' names, indigenous people's names. Red Jacket was a, is a, an indigenous chief. And the reason it's called Red Jacket is that he, he, was, he fought the British at one point. He liked the look of the Red Jacket, put it on, and then kept wearing it. So he says, I'm the Red Jacket. And then, you know, so a lot of the ships, a lot of, a lot, of, a lot of the ships, I know, a good, a good number of them were named after either American or South American uh, indigenous people of, of consequence. All right, so now, once you get to like near the Civil War time, near the 1850s and later, steel became a prevalent thing. So we mentioned that before. Um, so we had the Monitor. We, we kind of had an a incorrect name. We say the first steel ship was the Monitor and the Merrimack of the Civil War. The Merrimack, they're both U.S. ships, they're both English ships, both American ships, both uh, New England ships. The Monitor was made in Boston, and the Merrimack was made in New Hampshire. But it got captured, and the, South, the Southern Confederates took over the ship and renamed it the USS Georgia. So even though we call it the Monitor Merrimack, it's really the Monitor and the, and the Georgia. There's, 
the real the name of the ship when they when they had the battle. But you can see the barges. You can see the ship got a little bit bigger. You can see the ship on top. of the um, custom. You can carry more weight. Uh, Mississippi River boats became more popular. It was a big thing back in the day. So you can see the boats definitely got got bigger. And then the Gilded Age you know, ships got really big. There was one sea captain from Wellfleet, um, Captain Collins. He, he took advantage of the wealthy people who wanted to go to Europe and developed a, a ship line. It's called the Dramatic Ship Line, which eventually became the Cunard Line. So, you know, pretty well known shipping, you know, people spent money in the first rate cabins and you know, luxurious groups, which eventually uh, morphed into the Titanic, which comes in 1812. The ship that was completely a steel and could never sink. I saw the advertising, could never sink. Guess what? It could. So if you look at Cape Cod, one of the things that surprised, that doesn't surprise me, but just to look at how the water is situated. So on the, on the 6A side of Cape Cod, they didn't have big boats, but they had some boats. They had a lot of packet boats. Packet boat would be a smaller boat that would go to Boston. You know, people could just buy local supplies to do mail, pick up hats and clothing and things of that nature. Uh, whereas on the southern part, Falmouth, Harwich, and even a little bit of um, uh, Falmouth, Harwich, and Chatham, they would go out to much further. Sometimes they went to Boston first and then out to sea. But so there's just a little different differentiation there. The Atlantic Ocean, you know, they, it wasn't really worthwhile for the sea captains to begin from there or end there. I mean, the ocean was kind of rough and, and vigorous, so they wouldn't do that. So depending on where you were, I would say the big ports in that time period, the, uh, Falmouth is very big and Harwich is really big, and so was, so was Chatham to a degree. So Barnstable is a town that has two natural harbors. It's the only town that has two natural harbors. So you don't even have to build them. They're all pre-dredged pre for you. They're, 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 they're usable. So on 6A, you have the Barnstable Harbor. And then on the other side, you had you know, the, the Hyannis Harbor. There was a captain called Mad Jack Percival, who came from Yarmouth. And he was kind of the savior of old Ironsides in 1840-ish. They wanted to just to do away with old Ironside, which has served our country really well, but it cost an awful lot of money to repair. It's like back then, it was like seventeen thousand dollars or something. So Captain Percival said, "Tell you what, I know the trainer did. He was he was a, he was kind of a cadet trainer before they even had these schools. He was a trainer of cadets and knew a lot about shipping. He um, he did it for like four or five thousand dollars. He had local people support him. Didn't even use government money, and just to prove that it, it worked." He took all iron sights, not once, but twice around the world, stopping at different ports. So it was very seaworthy. He could prove how, how ships can be saved. Brewster is the town I live in. Um, if you ever read the book, The Cape, Cape Cod by Thoreau, he doesn't like, he didn't like Brewster. He says, too ostentatious, too modern, too uh, uh, fancy, luxurious. I don't know. At that point, there were 99 sea captains' homes that he knew about in Brewster. So I said, oh, I don't need that. But when you think about it, Brewster was kind of one of the more unusual places to have that many, because there's no natural harbors. You know, there's only a small, there's a couple of small beaches and so on. Um, but they had jetties. So one of the things they did, they would have these rock jetties. Sometimes they would hollow out the left-hand side. So when the, when, the, when the tide came in, the boats would come in with the tide, and then wait for the tide to go out, and the boats would go out. So people could use a jetty either walk or carry supplies, carry cargo, and so on. Um, the church is, is a big representation. One of the reasons why Harwich split with Brewster was the finances of the first parish church. Um, the, the Brewster people thought, hey, why do we have two chapters? You know, why contribute more money on a percentage basis? Why should we contribute the two churches? It should just be, why don't we have one and you have one? So in 1812, you know, it was, it was a split between, between those two things. If you go in, by the way, I was reading a uh, church bulletin that goes way back in the early 1800s, and they were saying, let's pray for the men of the USS Commodore. I'll pray for these. Uh, they, were, they would announce kind of in their weekly service who was going out to sea, um, where their destination was, and you know, they said prayers. And when they came back, they had a, a prayer service thanking, if they came back safe, they had a, a, a service that would dedicate that to them. One of the captains from uh, Harwich was Captain Isaac Clark. And he was a good friend with Captain Cobb. Elijah Cobb is kind of a big name for the shipping industry. He had a lot of ships. 
But he was going to, she was going to retire. Captain Clark wanted to retire. He crossed the ocean many times, 13 times, and didn't want to go back. He did not want to go back. Um, but Captain Cobb said, do me a favor, just one final trip. So he said, okay, one final trip. So where did he go? He went to East Africa. And I hate to say it, but the port that he went to was where the major port where slave trades were picked up. So he would never admit that. And in fact, he couldn't admit it. Back in 1802, America passed a law that slave trading was completely you know, illegal. So he could not, they, could, they, could, they did it sometimes. I wouldn't say they didn't, they did it. But they couldn't boast about it. They couldn't say they did it. Um, his ship became so diseased, 10 brothers, that it had to be fumigated. He just had to destroy the ship. And the reason that is when they carried slaves sometimes, the, you know, the bodies would, would, they would, many people would die on board in the disease and, and would just carry over just, you know, horrible living conditions. So, um, when he came back, his wife was very, very upset with Captain Cobb. Says, my husband is going to retire, we're going to have a nice life together, and you took him away from me. So there was always that, that conflict. Chatham is known for a few things. Chatham has, um, you've heard of a moon cusser? Moon cusser would be someone who wants the boats to come to the shore. Because if they wreck, back then you were allowed to kind of salvage the boat. You could take supplies, you could take equipment. You know, in the dead of night people would come and just take things and run off and, and do it. So moon cussing could work one of two ways. If it was too light out, people cussed the moon. It's too bright. Then you shepherds could see what they did. If it was too dark, sometimes they actually put lights up to pretend that it's a lighthouse or something to draw the ships in. So it could be, could be either way, depending on how they wanted to, to get the wrecks of it. Um, so that, there's even a hill called Wicked Hill in Chatham, which is, they say, was one of the major spots where this went on. It was, the reason why they began the lighthouse system was for the very reason. Chatham is the second lighthouse. Highland Light in Wealthy, uh, in Truro, was the very first one. So they had you know, five or six lighthouses built all the way you know, along from the, the coastline there. And because they wanted the ship captain to be safer. So it was with federal money used. And that was a big job. If you get to be a sea captain, I mean, you get to be a keeper of the lighthouse. You know, the money wasn't great, it was good money. You know, it, was, it was definitely work. It was like an honor and a privilege to do, to do that kind of work. Captain Crowell, the fellow who came from Chatham, I liked him. I'm lucky. I was fortunate to have been a school superintendent. But this guy was much more than that. This guy was a Civil War hero, a designer. At the end of his career, he became a school superintendent. And so he built two schools in Chatham. So he was kind of known as a, as a progressive uh, educator at, at one point. Dennis is another big town. The picture on the right, every, almost every town back then had a thing called a try, T-R-Y. When you think about a try, a try is where you process a whale. So you, you put these big you tr chunk of, peep, of blubber, put it in the pot, the boil off, and you get the oil, and you, know, you can do different things with the, with the meat and so on. Uh, but every inch of the whale was used. So you could, um, the, the, the teeth and the, uh, was used sometimes for, for, for different things, for furniture. The inside of the body was definitely shapeable. You could use that for chairs and so on. The bristle would use combs. And um, there was even a, like a small part of the brain. Whale tongue became a delicacy. I, I, just, I couldn't believe reading it, but every single inch of the whale was usable, or you could profit from, from the whale for that reason. So what, what would happen, they would bring it in, many people have to bring, if you didn't have a try on your boat, tries on them didn't exist until 1835, where the boats had actual tries on them, which was an improvement, because now you could go well and keep out at sea, and maybe you could get a second well or a third well, but otherwise you have to kind of bring this heavy big well into, into shore, into a try. So each one of the Cape Cod towns had that little try, where people would work and they would do their, they got a percentage of a take, so to speak, um, but that's what they would do. Dennis is also famous for building ships. There are two big places where they built ships. Shepherd uh, Boatyard is where Sassuan Harbor is. I don't know if you've boy off the roll cruise, but that, that, was, that was one boatyard. And then Corporation Beach, Corporation Road, was where the Napscasset people built boats. So there were a lot of built, Dennis definitely had, had a lot of boat building connected to it. Also, I had a captain called Henry Hall. Captain Hall was a cranberry grower. One thing, he was a farmer, as well as a, many of them were, farmers as well as a captain. So he kind of perfected the technique for cranberry growing. He noticed if you, if you did different things, if you put different chemicals, not chemicals, I said natural products. He would use um, salt sometimes, different things on them, and then irrigate a certain way, and, and confine the area, they would grow bigger. So he, used, he kept refining it and refining it. So eventually he kind of 
passed that on to other sea captains. So many sea captains actually became both cranberry growers and um, sea captains. And he would actually promote it. So he would go to each town and kind of sell cranberries, which, uh, was, which was a staple food by the indigenous people. With the, they had three main foods. They had corn, they had cranberries, and they had succotash. Those were the three big main things that they, they grew in their harvest. East Dam is famous for the, you know, the National Seashore. Um, when you think about it, the whole, whole area, you know, from Wealthy all the way through P-Town, um, there's, there's a lot of protected land now. You can't, you can't build on a lot of those lands now. Um, that house, Captain Peniman, Peniman's house, Captain Peniman is the fellow on the right-hand side. He had a house on Fort Hill. And a very rich fellow, did very, very well. He was, um, I think, 37 years for a whaler. Um, his wife would go on the ships with him quite a bit, and he brought his children with him a few times. I read a story that one time he brought two little cubs, white polar bear cubs. Kids thought they were cute, they were very small, but guess what? They grow, they grow very quickly. So even on the boat, even after like two months, these cubs became pretty big size, and they just eventually just jumped off the ship and the captain said, thank you. He was, he was very happy to have to bring the cubs back, back to Boston with him. Horwich had an interesting couple of interesting things. The fellow with the hand there. Um, you can see, if you, know, you probably can't see it too distinctly there, but Jonathan Walker was an abolitionist. So he was sailing on the coast of Florida, and, you know, and he heard that on the island there were, I think, 15 slaves who managed to escape and swam to this island. He was going to pick them up and, and bring them to Boston, kind of underground railroad type thing. Well, he got caught doing it. And there was a, back then they passed a rule called the Fugitive Slave Act, which meant that any time you catch a slave, you have to bring them back to the owner. There's no debate about it. So he got caught, and he couldn't go to the men otherwise. So what they did as a punishment, they didn't put him in jail, but they took his hand and a branding iron, and they put a big S, S, slave saver. They branded his hand with, a, with that. Kind of cruel. After that, he, went to, he became a, a big name. He wrote many books and moved to Ohio, became kind of a symbol of abolitionist work. <coughs> Another one, the Chase family, they were, they were big in Harwich. Um, he had seven sons. Um, most of them became sea captains, but one didn't. Caleb did not. Caleb Chase began the Chase and Sanborn Coffee Company. So if you, you know where Long Wharf is in Boston? Well, he, he began, he and the other five or six other merchant men from Cape Cod put the money in for this. So all the products coming into, into, into there was, was given to, to Long Wharf. So teas and coffee became very popular as a result of what he did. Mashby is a, that was the region that the, the you know, the, uh, the government said, well, what should we do with the indigenous people? You know, so you've got to have a spot for them. So they kind of put them all together. It wasn't just there, by the way. There were also little pockets. There was a pocket in Yarmouth and, and, and Parmesan, other small pockets. But Harwich was, I mean, um, Mashby was definitely the big one. One of the things they would do in Mashby, they would allow people to, the mother and dad would go to the local store and like buy a blanket, buy other food, provisions, whatever, and they would keep record of it. Then after about five, five months or something, they'd say, you need to pay the bill. And of course, often they didn't have the money to pay the bill. They said, well, the only thing available, we will take your son and we'll put him to work on our whaling ship and he'll work for us, and that'll, that'll be equal. That's for five years, and then we'll call it even. But guess what? They very rarely came back. They, most of the time, they found some way to keep them. They didn't, didn't work hard enough or didn't make the money. You know, most of the very, very rarely would these indigenous people come back. This fellow, William Appas, he wrote a book. He was a, a Wapano himself. He was really much against the way they were treated and wrote a book called a Native, a Native of the Forest which at the time became like a big abolitionist book, even before, Apple, uh, even before Uncle Tom's Cabin was, was big. Orleans, Orleans, some people wonder, why did Orleans get a French name? So if you ever wonder about that, there's a story with that. So there was a Captain Isaac Snow, who was fought, fought in the Revolutionary War, was captured, brought over to England. He's put in that prison right there, you see the, the old mill prison in England, managed to escape, and managed to get over to France. When he got to France, he met Marquis de Lafayette and he met Count d'Estaing, two rich young noblemen. And they both supported the American democratic cause very much. They gave money to it. So when he came back, at that point in time, um, Wolfleet 
it was divided, you know, the East End was divided into Well Fleet, East End, and Orleans were all part of, of one time. So he was a member of the local Congress and said, let's call this neck, in other words, Orleans, which is where the first county they met. Contestant lived there in Orleans. So that's in, in tribute to, that, to this French count who lived there. It's a picture of old lion size. You mentioned that nice fellow before that was Crosby, the cannoneer. Provincetown is another little place too, which was big on whaling. The one place where um, black sailors could be, meritocracy was really big. It wasn't true everywhere, but in, in whaling it was. So if you were a good whale and you knew what you were doing, you could rise up and become you know, high in the profession, so to speak. In fact, that captain right there, Epsilon Boston, was one of the biggest, uh, had all black ship, all, all his crew members were black. He became one of the richest men in the province now. Um, so it can be done, but that was, like I said, it was kind of an exception rather than, than a rule. <clears throat> but you can see how dangerous the, the whaling adventures were, were back then. <coughs> in the town, have you heard of Admiral McMillan? He was you know, a relatively famous fellow. He was, if, you, if you can remember, it's hard for me to even say it, but imagine this. He was one of the oldest sea captains in World War I. But he also fought in World War II. So I'm, I'm not sure the exact age he was then. But he was a big, he was very famous a scientist more than a sea captain. He did a lot of the Arctic expeditions. Um, so he, was, he thought he was going to the North Pole and didn't quite make it, but thought he did. He went there many, many times. Um, he went to Bowdoin College. So he had a little boat. It's called the Bowdoin. And they, in honor of him, all of his expeditions, they named the pier in Provincetown on that McMillan Pier. So if you go downtown, you know, that big shot, this parking area, that's all McMillan Pier right there. The sandwich um, wasn't built on glass, but it was built by glass. So the sandwich glass factory was huge. Between 1820 and 1850, it was like an employee at least half the town, if not more. So he would get people in from Ireland who were the, the, the real hard laborers who would carry the different things in. Um, and they, he also began a process of molding glass. So not only did blowing, which was really complicated and artistic, it could mold glass, which was a much easier process. So if you want vases, you can make like a, one mold, pour the liquid in, and just press it right out again. So he, he, he became very, very wealthy. You can see how big a sandwich glass company was. The picture on the left hand side is huge. They had expedition, expedition exposition in, in Chicago in 1876, I think the first one. And he was the largest exhibitor at that, at that exposition. So fellow from Cape Cod. Did very, very well. He had a boat called the Acorn. I'll, I'll tell you a very short story about the Acorn. When the railroads came into being, 1850-ish, uh, the owner, which is Deming Jarvis of the Sandwich Glass Company, said, well, I, I have a choice now. I could just ship my boat, ship my glass by, by boat, or I could take a train. And he didn't like the rates, the, the fares, the trains were charging. He said, oh, that's too much money. So they, they, they kind of made fun of him. They kind of the railroad people said, they're crazy. It's the easiest way. It's the most productive way to go. So the railroad ex chairman of the board said, the acorn has not fallen from a tree that will build a tree big enough to, <laughs> to build a boat to go to Boston. And so he just kind of made fun of them. Um, back then, you know, there weren't that many trees in, in, in Cape Cod. You know, because of the tri work, you know, between 1820 and 1830, many, most of the trees are kind of decimated throughout Cape Cod. That's why you got a lot of scraggly pines now. You don't have apples, maples, or elms or anything. Most, you know, very few trees. So he built a ship in one year and called it the acorn. So that was, that was his way of, of getting back to the people. Truro was, Truro was kind of famous for two things. I, I mentioned that dramatic ship line before. There's a picture of one of the ships from, from Edward Knight Collins, um, you know, taking passengers to Europe. They began at Boston Harbor, too. You see, they had lighthouses. They had, it's called Nixon Mate. Just a protective thing you put in the harbor so ships knew how to sail around it and so on. But also they had life saving stations along the way, which is like a precursor to the Coast Guard. So these men would work 12 hour shifts, you know, morning and night, and they would, that's all they would do patrol the ocean. If the ship sank or became endangered, they would run out and save people's lives, which eventually, they and the Internal Revenue Service, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Service, combined, they became the U.S.S. Coast Guard later on. Wellfleet, one thing interesting about Wellfleet, in 1850, it's called a pinky boat. The boat up on top was called a pinky boat. And it wasn't called pinky because of the color or anything else. But just, they just thought that boat looked like a pinky. So I'm not sure what that was all about. Um, 
But there was one fellow whose name is Lorenzo Dow Baker, who was a pretty good sea captain. He was doing very well bringing products from South America back to, your, back to the Boston. He began but the uh, fruit company. He began the Boston Fruit Company, the first one. Bananas and different exotic fruits, and became very, very popular. So what they began doing, you see these plantations were began building, and they were plantations. So, I mean, they treated the, their people just like plantations. I'm not going to say it otherwise. That's the way I, the way I see it. You know, so they didn't give them a lot of equities or equal treatment, but they, they, you know, they, they made them work hard, and they, they, took, they took the profit. And then the final fellow I'm going to mention to you is Asser Eldridge. He's probably one of the, one of the biggest captains of, of them all. He had a boat called Red Jacket. We talked about that before a little bit. Um, if you go to Yarmouth, if you go on the north part, the 6A part, they have an area of town right in the middle of like a little square. They're called the Captain's Mile. So you see like a little plaque on top of a home, a little small thing. And he was definitely, whoever had that would be a sea captain. And then on, on the Beth River Bridge, on the 28th, where right where we cross over, there's a cluster of homes in there, about 30 of them, or more, 50 homes in there. And they're, they're, that, might, that might become the second Yarmouth Mile. But this is the, the first mile of sea captains. So, you know, if I leave you with one thought, two thoughts, one thought I'll leave with you. Every town contributed to maritime history. Every town did something that advanced the cause of maritime history. Second thing I'll mention to you is you learned a little bit today about, just a little bit, about one captain from each town. But if you read my book, Sea Captain of Cape Cod, you could learn a little bit more. I, I talk about five sea captains, a little bit more depth on each one. So by all means, it's available on Amazon, available in most Cape Cod bookstores. So I, I appreciate your coming out tonight and, and hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much.